back to JG3 Reviews. Today, we're looking at a pen that a lot of you have wanted to know about, and uh, maybe you've even already watched a few reviews with mixed reviews. This is a pen that is built on a legend, the Parker 51, a pen that people describe as iconic and classic and the standard of all, you know, hooded nibbed pens. And uh, they came out with a new reissue. And it's a question on a lot of our minds. Is this reissue, the new uh, Parker 51, is this like a true reissue of the pen or is it like Parker 51 light? You may already have uh, your opinion made up, but I want you to stick with me as we look at some things that I like, some things that I don't like about the design, and uh, we're going to look at the question about the price because I think that the price of this pen is where a lot of people are kind of tripping up a little bit, and I think with good reason, and yet I think, I think there are two sides to this coin. So we will look at the pen, what we like and don't like, and all of that good stuff, and how does it uh, compare to some of the competition. So Parker 51 reissue, you know, is it any good? Is it not? Let's flip that camera and check it out. All right, let's take a look at this Parker. Now I got the blue pen with the silver trim and uh, just the standard steel nib. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, I wanna first start with the box. I'm not a huge box person. It doesn't make or break a deal for me if it comes with a fancy box or a non-fancy box. Uh, even pens uh, more expensive than this come with some pretty plain boxes. The Lamy 2000, the, the Pilot uh, Decimo or Capless Vanishing Point, those pens, they come with very plain boxes. So, you know, don't, don't blow this out of proportion. Uh, but there is an interesting comparison that I want to make um, with a pen that actually is both American and less money. So this is the Parker. It comes in a, a plain gray box. You open it up and you know I think that's nice as a, a gift presentation sort of thing. But there are a couple of things in here that you know well, let me just tell you. Uh, you. You get the pen out. We'll take a second here. And you open it up and there is one cartridge. That's it. One cartridge. Uh, where's the converter? You know how I feel about converters. And some people are going to say, oh, well, but you know not everybody uses a converter. Da -da 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 -da. A pen that is a cartridge converter pen in this price range, uh, they chose not to make it a vacuumatic. They chose not to make it uh, with a fill system that is built in and instead sold it as a feature that it is a cartridge converter pen. Not to belabor the point, not to do a dead horse, but you know what I think about that. Where's the converter? So, uh, Let's look at the pen and I will show you, but wait, 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 wait. Is there, is there something else here? There's nothing here. Now for me, it doesn't bother me. I, don't, uh, I would like a warranty card. I would like uh, for someone who is new to the fountain pen world, and maybe they were excited about getting this because it was their grandpa or their grandma's pen, right? Might they need instructions on how to fill it, how to clean it, but they're, 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 they're not there. So that's, that's kind of weird to me. Uh, I don't know what you may or may not expect to be in there, but uh, those are a couple of things, a converter and some, some instructions for somebody who may be uh, gifted this pin as their first pin. Let me compare this with, this is a Conklin Durograph. This was a special edition that I got uh, from Goulet Pins bought from Goulet pens, not got from Goulet pens, uh, a while back, and I still need to review this pen, and uh, this is after they started using the Yobo nibs, and this is a stub, and all of that. But look how much nicer this pen, and this pen, by the way, $30 cheaper than the Parker. $30. And look how much nicer uh, the box is. If you take this out, you will find not one but two ink cartridges. That's again, it's not the biggest deal in the world, uh, but you do get literature and instructions and warranty and, and all of that good stuff in a less expensive 
pen. And then there's one other thing that you get inside this pen. I gotta show this to you. Would you look at that? What is, what is that? That, that, wait, what? That's a, yeah, it, it was in there. So, Parker, I love you, but uh, come on, step it up a little bit, step it up a little bit. Now the pen itself, let's look at this. First, you already know I like this style pen. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that. What they have uh, in common with the classic pen is just kind of that basic shape. It is a uh, hooded nib. It is now a screw-on cap, and that's to keep it from drying out and, and secure and things, and that doesn't bother me. I like that. Uh, but it has a very similar look. It's not identical and the dimensions are not the same, and the nib is entirely different. We'll get to that. Uh, but it, it resembles the Parker 51 that we all know and some love, right? Uh, the quality of the pen. Let's start with a clip. It is uh, the more modern Parker-styled uh, clip. Good steel, strong, all that good stuff. Uh, the finial at the cap is no longer jeweled like in the past, or some of the pins in the past, but instead it's actually, if you'll look closely, it's kind of a vented finial. So uh, that's a little bit of a change, and I think it looks nice. It, it's nicely done. Uh, the clip itself, as it comes into the cap, is uh, probably a slight step above a jotter, nothing fancy, uh, and we'll, we'll see that in a second, I think. I, at the band, it has a polished band and, uh, a, and stamped or engraved, stamped, I believe, the Parker logo and name, and that is really nicely done. If you compare this to, say, let's, let's do a little bit of a comparison, the, uh, the Wing Sung, I mean, that is much more nicely done, and this Wing Sung is no slouch but that is more nicely done. So uh, that's just, I'll put that back down there with the rest of the elephants in the room. And uh, then you have where it's made. This is important. Some people had wondered because of the Jin Hao back here being made in China and looking so much like the deluxe version of this pin, if perhaps Jin Hao might actually be contracted to make these. No, this is actually made in uh, Parker and Waterman's factory in France. So it is a, a French, actually I'm looking at the wrong side of the cap there. There you go. It is a French Parker and that is also emblazoned upon the cap. I think the cap's nice. And then you have of course just a slick uh, plastic barrel or resin barrel. And uh, that's done nicely. It seems to be of a, a good quality. You do have this stainless steel band here, and you have in mine, there, there is going to be a converter, but it's going to be a Lamy because I don't have a Parker converter on hand at the moment free. So I just stole the one out of my studio, which does work, and uh, frankly I enjoyed putting that in there, although honestly, Lamy does the same thing, so it's not like they're off the hook either. Anyway, you have a hooded nib, and this nib is the same. Others have said it. I agree with them. Uh, this is the same nib as you will find in the Jotter and in the uh, Vector. Both of those are the same. In fact, let me grab my Jotter, and I'll put these side by side. Of course, the, in the Jotter, the nib is exposed. So here you go. But they are the same nib and looks to be the same feed in these pins. Now, depending on your preferences and how much you like the nib in the jotter or how much you think a pin at this price should have its own special nib, that will be fine or not fine with you. I only have, I have three pins with this same nib, uh, the Vector, the jotter, and this Parker 51. All of mine are mediums, and that's for a reason. I really do like this nib in the medium. So I could fuss about this. I could gripe about this. Uh, all I would do is fill your time with negativity. Uh, but I like the nib. Now, I've noticed that those who don't like the nib, whether it's in the jotter or maybe even in this, if, uh, if you watch a review and somebody uh, doesn't like this nib, uh, check and see because it's probably the fine. And I have I I don't have a fine in this nib, so I'm not going to speak to it. But I noticed that uh, just in looking at at the jotter and the vector, uh, 
the medium it gets higher reviews. It's a nice smooth nib with lots of nib material. I find it to be extremely reliable. It's uh, so you know I don't have a complaint about that. Uh, but that is the reality. If you don't like that jotter nib, you're not going to like this nib. If you have one and you love it, then probably you're going to have the same experience here. So uh, your mileage may vary. My mileage has been fine on all three of these medium nibbed. Parker pins. I like them all, so there is that. But as far as the style, uh, it's familiar and yet slightly different. Uh, very comfortable to use. It writes well, and I'll show you that here in the writing test, although I'm probably drying this pin out like crazy at the moment. But uh, I do I do actually like the, the feel of the pin. The look feels, uh, of course, a little slightly off from a classic Parker, but uh, I, that's it's it's several uh, decades old at this point. A few changes and things that's not going to bother me. Now, what I would have done differently if I were you know Parker, uh, but I'm not. It's their job, not mine. Is I would have introduced, and I hope they will introduce. Maybe they will, uh, based on feedback from this pen, uh, some of the other filling mechanisms because some of those to me are what make the pen special. And really, uh, look back at their history and the cartridge converter version of this pen, while popular among pen users today, that was their least popular version, if I understand the numbers right. So, uh, I, you know, I understand why they went with it. I get it, I get the decision, and it's, it's a market-based decision, but we'll see whether or not the market actually responds the way they expected, because I do think that uh, when there is competition from pens like that Wingsung that actually have the push-button vacuumatic filling system, uh, maybe it would behoove them to add that to their lineup. And Okay, so I've seen this pen uh, anywhere from 67 at a pretty good discount all the way up to 82 uh, without discount pre-orders and things like that. Uh, so it's not a cheap and expensive pen to the majority of people. And is that okay? Well, that's really going to depend on what you particularly think, on what your budget is. I will say this, and I wanted to bring this up. Uh, in looking at a, a, a discussion of Parker 51s and their price when they were originally sold in the 50s and the 60s and everything, uh, I noticed the, a couple of advertisements, and I'm going to put them up here on the screen. The cheapest one, for example, in I think that was 1951, was $12.50. And that doesn't sound like much, and it makes it seem like this pen at, let's just say, 80 bucks is really expensive, which you may be thinking it is even without inflation. However, same pen uh, that's in that ad, uh, adjusted for inflation, would be around $125, therefore more expensive by half than the reissued Parker 51. Now you can argue uh, better quality materials, maybe better craftsmanship on the nib. Uh, there, there are arguments to be made that might justify the difference between the two, but I bring that up to say some of our sticker shock is because we live in an age where we buy ex even more expensive things more cheaply very often and we don't even realize it. Uh, because it's expensive to us now, we assume it was not expensive when the dollar was worth more. And that's, that's just not true. So the price may not be as crazy out of line as, uh, as I would think or as you might think. If you look at the, uh, there's the Esterbrook that's a lot like the Parker 51, and I'll throw a picture up of that as well and, and the model name. But that Esterbrook uh, reissue, and at least in the photo, some of you can tell me whether or not you have experience and whether or not that pen is worth that price. Uh, but it looks to me like it wouldn't cost as much as, but it actually costs more. So. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's really not as far out of line with some of the competition as we think when you look at American competition, Italian competition, and French competition, or German. Uh, but when you compare it to these pins, uh, then of course it looks a lot more 
expensive, and I'm going to leave it with you whether or not you think it's fair to judge it by these instead of by uh, longer, more renowned uh, pen companies with a history who are selling pens made about the same as this, uh, with some of the same features and flaws as this, uh, and where this actually comes in a little bit cheaper. And I'm just thinking maybe that's where Parker is coming from on their price point. Now, when you get to the gold nibbed one, gold nib Bob always is going to cost a lot more, but uh, the price does seem out of proportion. Uh, it's it's not like you're dealing with that much gold, right? So uh, there is is that when you start to look at the deluxe model and things like that. And I just think that one's price is, is, uh, is, is out of proportion with the pen itself for certain, regardless of whether you do or don't think that about this one. I, I think it's out of proportion. I think it's a wonderful 40, 35. Uh, I'd say, yeah, 35 on the street, 45 for uh, maybe MSRP. So I think it's out of proportion, but I'm, I'm judging that by other pens and honestly judging it by its comparison to a jotter, which is obviously a less expensive pen and it doesn't have as much uh, fit, finish, and polish as this, but it has the same nib and it's going to be just as reliable and uh, so you get where I'm going with that. Now let's... The Parker 51 and an asterisk for the uh, the reissue. This is a medium nib and as I said I do really like this nib. So all those other issues aside, do I like that? Yeah. I really do. And this is the Oxford Blue from Diamine. 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 Oxford Blue. I can't think and do all of that at the same time today. Uh, at least, I told you about my injury last week. At least that's doing better, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, let's see. Of course, this is not a pen where you get line variation uh, in any of its forms like this, so that's not really expected. It does, uh, of course, write really well, and I find it to be very reliable and uh, no issues there. It, it keeps up really well. So that part's good. And uh, let me just be quiet and let you listen. My table is really shaky today. You may be hearing that. Got pins rolling around. All that good stuff. So, who knows? Uh, but it writes really well. I, and a good medium line and good saturation. Let me show you wetness here. Move that out of the way. And uh, so, uh, plenty wet for me. And I do like the way that the pen writes. Of course, the form of this pen is so familiar because I have so many of these other pens that are, are made in its image. So uh, that's not a surprise. You either like this pen already or you don't like this pen already. You, uh, you like or you don't like some of the compromises. But let's look at it forgetting that the other pen existed for a second. Just, just forget the old pen for a second. Uh, would I like this pen if it were not a reissue? And the answer is yes. I would actually still have those issues with the price. I would, maybe even more so. Uh, but the pen itself, do I like the pen? I like the way it's made. Uh, it's, it's a convenient pen. It's cartridge converter. Some people don't like that. I told you I would actually prefer if it was a vacuumatic. Um, but I like the pen. Uh, they, they should throw the converter in. Uh, it doesn't bother me that they used a tried and true nib. Uh, I don't know why that should bother me. A lot of pen companies do that. That's not unusual. Um, and it actually turns out to be one that I have good experience with. Now, maybe if I got the fine or, or something like that, uh, maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I would have been disappointed. But I went with a nib that I was already familiar with in the medium because I knew that I already liked that, and I, I didn't want to be disappointed, right? So uh, there is that. That's all going to be up to you. That's all getting into personal stuff. Uh, but I, I do like the pen, as just, just as a pen, writing with it, uh, carrying it every day, and I've used it quite a bit since I got it. Uh, yeah, 
I do. I like the pen. Uh, do, are there things I would change? Well, of course. But there, there are things I would change about the Lamy 2000. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to that review. Uh, it just, it is okay. I can, I, I think I will survive the big Parker 51 reissue controversy of 2021. And uh, we'll talk about later in the next review uh, this pen and how it compares and how it stands on its own. I didn't, I don't, even though I own both, I didn't cross shop them in that sense at all. I was interested in them separately. And so we'll talk about that in that next review. In the meantime, I pray that you do well. God bless you and have a great week.